Local news reports a man was killed this afternoon when the SUV he was driving went out of control and crashed into a concrete support for the Simpson Street Bridge, just below the Haney Expressway. Metro police say 48-year-old Byron Evans was pronounced dead at the scene. It is believed that excessive speed may have caused the accident. It was the local news on the channel at 10 hours p.m., which in our house we watched every evening as a religion. It was my husband's choice, and I rarely listened when they walked. But when Byron Evans' name came up, I immediately perked up. I listened to the end of the report but was not entirely sure of what I heard. However, the hairs on the back of my neck stood on end, and my heart began to beat faster, in fear of hearing the worst news in a long time. But I couldn't make it clear. I couldn't let my husband know that I was interested in this report about the accident. I thought about taking the remote and changing to other local news channels, but I was afraid it would look suspicious, since we never watch news on other channels. Then I remembered that the channel's website has printed versions of news reports, and perhaps the written version had already been published. I stood up and pretended to stretch for a minute, then calmly walked into the office, which was located next to our living room. I wanted to run because I needed to know. But again, my husband had no way of knowing why I was looking. Even though our computer was updated to the latest processors, it seemed to take forever to boot. The home screen finally appeared. I logged into Chrome and opened the channel's website. I scrolled down, looking for the local news section. Here it is, word for word, as it was read in the news a few minutes ago. The more I read, the more my tears flowed. Byron Evans was my partner in a ten-month secret affair. The man I cheated on my husband with was dead. I hung my head and cried. My name is Julie Harris. My husband's name is Richard, but he was always rich to me as soon as I knew him. We have two sons, both with higher education and successful lives, although neither of them has yet given us grandchildren. Rich and I met in college. We dated for about a year before he proposed to me on campus in the spring of our third year. We decided to wait until graduation before getting married, although, of course, our sexual attraction did not take long to develop. The first time Rich and I made love was magical, and basically convinced me because everything else about it seemed perfect. We both had experience before we met each other, so it was never an issue. We each knew what we wanted in a sexual partner, and I think we both liked what we saw in each other. In other words, it seemed that we were marrying those who were suitable for us. We both started working immediately after college, rich in banking, and I became an elementary school teacher. When we had our children, Rich was so successful that I was able to stay home with our boys. It was difficult because one of the aspects of the job that I enjoyed was the camaraderie I felt with my colleagues at the school where I taught. When my conversations were suddenly reduced to interactions with my two young sons, I missed adult interaction. But I managed and stayed home until our youngest was able to get to high school on his own. I'm proud to be a homemaker. I think it was a blessing for our children and my husband didn't have to worry about keeping the house tidy, at least on weekdays. But I was ready to return to the big world. Since my teaching certificate had long since expired, I knew this was no longer an option. So I started looking for other career opportunities, knowing that wherever I went, I would be starting from scratch, without any preparation. While researching job openings websites in our area, I became interested in an offer from a real estate agency offering free training to obtain a realtor license. Having stayed at home and raised children for most of my adult life, I enjoyed reading various home magazines especially home decor and design. So I sent a request by email and received a response the next day. From there, I was accepted into the training program and soon received my license. The licensing ceremony was attended by various real estate agencies looking for new realtors, and I was able to secure a position with Sunshine Agency. I've been fortunate to be in the $4 million sales club for the last five years. I'm good at my job. Rich and I are still a very attractive couple. He is 6F, 2 and tall, and stays fit by going to the gym three or four mornings a week. I don't have a gym membership, but I try to walk as many steps a day as possible while being careful about what I eat. I'm only 5'8", tall, with an average build.
As I approach 50, I know there are places on my body that don't look as firm as they did 25 years ago. But overall, I am very pleased with how I managed to preserve myself. For the most part, we have a very good marriage. Rich has always been a great provider. Several years ago, he was hired as a bank inspector, a job that required him to be away from home while they spent several days visiting banks in other cities. Fortunately, he waited until the boys graduated from high school before accepting this new position because he was always available to attend games and other events in which the boys were participating. Sex with Rich was always great. He wasn't the biggest I've ever been with, but he was attentive and thorough. Our sex felt like a partnership, just like our marriage, and he made sure both of our needs were met. As is often the case with most couples, things slowed down when the kids were born. I tried not to attack Rich when he got home from work every day, knowing he would be tired, and I didn't want to seem like a sex-obsessed witch who only wanted her husband for one reason. When we made love, it was still good, but our love almost became a routine these years. I was looking forward to empty nest syndrome hitting our home because I was hoping our sex life would return to the level it was at when we first got married. I even went out and bought new underwear to wear for the first week once our youngest left for college. This was supposed to be our time, spending the rest of our days together, enjoying each other as we settled into retirement. But it seems his interest never returned. It seems so trivial now. A woman in her 40s rediscovering her sex drive while a man in his 40s was allowing his to wane. I found myself in a difficult situation. I felt like I needed this more to reaffirm the hope that he still loved me and was still interested in my body and what it had to offer him. But again, I didn't want to seem clingy and desperate. I wanted more sex, but I wanted it to be his idea. The impossible task was how to make these two things happen together. I read books and online articles and magazines about other women in my shoes. Some were able to make progress in their marriage through counseling, but many were like me, not wanting to press the issue for fear of being rejected so much that he no longer wanted to stay married to me. The thought of being single at my age didn't appeal to me at all. As I continued reading, I discovered that other women were finding a way out of marriage to gain confirmation that they were still attractive as sexual beings. Many of these women were just regular cheaters, finding their sexual needs satisfied in a variety of ways. Others have actually reached agreements with their husbands to have a boyfriend or two on the side, solely to satisfy their sexual needs. I didn't want to cheat on my husband at all, neither secretly nor with his permission. I grew up in a good home with good values, and finding a life partner meant forever, no questions asked. So I resigned myself to the frustration of trying to satisfy my sexual needs with my own hands, knowing that it was not as good as having my needs met by my husband. But I also felt that it was not just my sexual needs that were going unmet. I also missed the feeling of affection that we used to share. When we first started dating, we did everything to be together, showing each other how important we were to each other. Wherever we went, we held hands and shared fleeting kisses for no reason. He always made me feel attractive and wanted. Both of these things were important to me, but now I wasn't sure if he thought I was still attractive. He would come home from work, especially after being on a business trip checking a bank, and settle into his chair in front of the TV. We fell into a routine of individualism, he in his place and I in mine. The problem is that our places never merged, never connected. His happiness meant returning home to a comfortable home, going about his business according to his schedule. His happiness and my happiness were two completely different things, and my happiness was no more. Not once in all this time did I make a conscious decision to cheat on Richa. After all, I was still a good girl a conscientious wife who knew that marriage lasts a lifetime and no one guarantees that life will always be happy. With that in mind, I was not looking for a partner for a scam. I didn't want to be that kind of person. When Byron Evans came into my life, he and his wife Gloria were looking for a new home, and I was their real estate agent. Byron owned his own accounting firm and was very successful in hiring the best accountants paying them above the city average to attract and retain 
the best of the best. This allowed Byron and Gloria to buy a large house in a fashionable suburb. I organized several showings that I thought would suit their needs. The first couple of times I showed them the property, I didn't notice anything unusual. Byron and Gloria appeared to be a happy couple, hugging and holding hands. In fact, I remember feeling a little jealous of their mutual affection, which was missing in my marriage. Their love for each other motivated me to look even harder for properties for them. They deserved their dream home, and I wanted to make that possible for them. But after the first two shows, something changed, at least in my head. I began to notice subtle differences in the way Byron interacted with me. There were some looks, especially when I showed a little cleavage, or maybe my skirt rode up a little higher as we looked into closets and drawers. Sometimes he accidentally touched me. At first I thought it was completely innocent and non-sexual touching, but as it continued, I realized it was intentional. At first it was flattering. These small gestures were part of the intimacy I'd been missing with Rich. It was great to feel attractive again. I began to return his views with my own. I caught his eye on me. And when our eyes met, I smiled, letting him know that I liked his interest. I also began to learn the art of hiding my views from Gloria. We would try to keep her distracted, or maybe even in another room of the house, before Byron and I started flirting with each other. Gloria had very high standards for her next home, so this meant we looked at at least a dozen houses before she fell in love with one. The entire time we were looking at houses, the sexual chemistry between Byron and I intensified. At first, I pretended that she didn't exist and that my behavior could be justified by saying that I was doing everything possible to sell a nice couple their dream home. But this thought did not last long, and it became clear to me that the opportunity for more was available. I loved being the object of desire again. I loved the attention Byron gave me. The longer this went on, the more I knew I wanted more. I was sad that day when I showed them the house that Gloria loved, because I knew if they bought it, the showings would stop, and I would have no reason to see Byron anymore. As we toured this last house and as Gloria began to realize it was her, she would retreat to a specific room or area of the house, leaving Byron and I alone for a few seconds. We looked at each other with smiles on our faces, each probably thinking lewd thoughts as Gloria continued her inspection. When we heard the back door open and saw her in the yard, Byron closed the distance between us and kissed me, carefully hiding us from the window so that Gloria wouldn't see us. It was exciting. We broke the kiss after about five seconds, but I wanted it to last. We hurriedly went to join Gloria in the yard, and as we walked towards her, I felt an unusual feeling of excitement. My body reacted to the kiss in just five seconds. It loved what it experienced. Byron and Gloria decided on the spot that this was the house they wanted. I went to my car to get a blank copy of the Notice of Intent to Buy form, which was not yet a formal contract, but indicated to the seller that the intent to buy was present. They agreed to the price they wanted to offer, and I started filling out the contract. I leaned over the bar, filling out the form, and realized that I was wearing a blouse that was cut quite low. As I bent over, my bra-covered breasts were on full display and I looked up to see Byron enjoying the view. Catching him looking like that wouldn't change anything about my already damp panties. After signing the offer form, we parted ways. They went back to their current home and I went back to my office to submit the form. At home that evening, sitting with Rich and watching TV after dinner, I couldn't help but remember the showing of the house earlier that day especially Byron's kiss and his obvious interest in me. I felt extremely guilty and wondered if I should tell Rich about this. Instead, I decided that it was just a one-time mistak and that I could prevent similar behavior in the future. Telling Rich would only draw more attention to the individual failure than he deserved. The next day, I received a counteroffer to the Evans's proposal, so I called Gloria with the news. She told me she would call Byron, and they would get back to me soon. About 20 minutes later, Byron called me. He said they would like to make another offer, but he wanted to look at the house again before doing so. We agreed to meet later in the day. I arrived at the house about 10 minutes before the appointed time so that I could turn on the lights and unlock the doors. When I saw the Evans's car pull up, I expected to see Gloria and Byron. 
However, when only Byron got out of the car, my heart quickened, remembering our incident yesterday in this very place. Byron smiled as he walked through the door. I remembered the decision I'd made the night before. Kissing him was a mistake I wasn't going to make again. He came up to me and, without stopping, put his hands on my shoulders. I looked at him and asked, Did you want to see the house again? He smiled back and said, Well, not really. I wanted to see the realtor again. With these words, he leaned down and kissed me, and all my resistance dissipated. Here was a man who was interested in me, who clearly wanted more than my professional help in buying a house. It had been a long time since I had felt needed or wanted in that way, and I quickly gave up. We stood in the front room of this house, kissing for what seemed like at least five minutes. As soon as we stopped, he walked to the front door to make sure it was locked, while I relocked the back and garage doors that I had just opened before he arrived. We nervously moved closer to each other again, but this time our kisses were more aggressive, our hands exploring our bodies while our tongues explored each other. During one of our kissing breaks, Byron said, I've never done this before. I just shook my head and said, Me neither, and I really didn't plan for it. I didn't plan either, but as soon as I saw you, I knew my plans had changed. You're so beautiful and sexy and full of life, and I knew I wanted you. His words made my heart expand. After such a long time without any attention from my husband, finding out that Byron thought that way about me was the best news I'd had in a long time. I hugged him again while he caressed my breasts and my buttocks with his hands. Then I realized that I would let him have sex with me. I realized that I was going to cheat on my husband. There was no furniture in the house, so he led me to the bar counter, the same one where he looked into my blouse yesterday. Without wasting much time, we quickly undressed. He quickly took off his shoes and pants and then bent me over the bar and hiked my skirt up to my waist. He roughly grabbed my panties and pulled them down. I suddenly found myself naked in front of a man who was not my husband, but instead of feeling guilty, I only felt a thirst to have him inside me. I turned around to see that Byron was no bigger than my husband, but it wasn't about needing to have him inside me. It was all about feeling desire, feeling attractive, and knowing that a man I barely knew wanted to fuck me. I panicked so much, which one is no use protection. I may be almost 50, but I had not yet gone through menopause, which meant I was most likely still fertile. The rare times Rich had sex with me, we were safe because he had a vasectomy after the birth of our second child. And now here I am, worried about getting pregnant for the first time in almost 25 years. Byron saw the worry in my eyes. What happened, Julie? Wasn't that good for you? I shook my head in denial and replied, No, it was very good. But we didn't use protection. I can't get pregnant, not at my age. Moreover, my husband had a vasectomy many years ago. If I get pregnant, it will be pretty easy for him to figure out that he is not the father. Byron put his hand on my shoulder and said, Calm down after our last baby, I had a vasectomy too, and it's still working. With relief, I laid my head on his chest. I didn't know what was going to happen with this new thing we had just created but I did know that we would have to be extremely careful in every aspect of it because I knew. I didn't want anyone else to knew about it, and I'm sure he felt the same. We quickly got ourselves in order, at least on the outside. I was a whirlwind of emotions inside, still excited knowing that another man found me attractive enough to fuck, nervously hoping that my panties would be able to hold what he left inside, not sure if this was a one-time thing or if we would try it again, and perhaps most noticeably, embarrassment at how I allowed this to happen. For some reason, the expected feeling of guilt had not yet hit me. Byron came over and kissed me and hugged me. There were no words. What do you say to the person with whom you just broke your marriage vows? He started towards the door when I stopped him. He stopped and looked at me, not understanding why I stopped him. Do you remember why you really came here? New offer? With a sheepish smile, he approached the bar again. I took out the proposal sheet and went through the contents with him. He signed the proposal and then kissed me again. This time, before he headed for the door, he whispered in my ear, That was wonderful. 
You're beautiful and sexy, and I hope we can do it again. I was seething inside with excitement as I watched him leave. When he left, the full weight of what had happened had fell on me, and for the first time I felt guilt descending on me. My husband loved me and I loved him. I selfishly ignored this love to satisfy my desire to feel attractive. This is not what a good wife does. A good wife accepts that a strong relationship is not just about sex and puts aside her own selfish needs to be there for her husband. The drive back to the office gave me time to think about what I had done. By the time I pulled into the lot, I had convinced myself that it was a one-time mistake that wouldn't happen again. This decision was reinforced when I went into the office restroom to freshen up. That evening at home, I tried to act as normal, although this was not necessary, because Rich would hardly have paid attention to me after I cheated if he had not paid attention to me before. I left work early so I could get home before him and take a shower to wash off the evidence of my affair. Even dressed casually after a shower, he still didn't notice me beyond the usual, Hi, how was your day? More than a meaningless conversation, he made no attempt to acknowledge me that evening, and when we went to bed without a single kiss, I was already planning to meet Byron again. It turned out that meeting him for sex was not as difficult as I initially thought. He suggested setting up private email accounts for both of us to exchange messages with because we both used our phones for work communications and didn't want incriminating evidence showing up on them. As the owner of his own accounting firm, it wasn't strange for him to spend time outside the office meeting with clients during the day. So his absence during our meetings did not arouse suspicion. My job was the same. I showed houses throughout the day, and it actually turned out to be the best place for us to meet. These were only houses listed for sale by the company I worked for, so even if another realtor on the long list wanted to show the house, he would have to take the keys from us, and if I had a key to the house, I knew that they couldn't have it until I returned it. We just had to be careful not to get caught, so houses without curtains or curtains weren't an option. I also tried to choose furnished houses, but this was not always possible, so there were times like our first time together where we had to be creative with our positions. We varied meeting times, so there was no recognizable pattern. Our big challenge was making sure we didn't meet too often that people would become suspicious. I knew that in Rich's case, after our first meeting, I could hide it from him, since one of the purposes of my affair was that he had practically ignored me for several years. Plus, he and Byron's wife, Gloria, couldn't get away from work as easily during the day as Byron and I could. The frequency we settled on did not raise suspicion among our colleagues, because it seemed that we were simply doing our job. I knew at the time that if I was caught in the house I was supposed to show, I would probably be fired. This was a bigger fear for me than being discovered by Rich, simply because I knew Rich would never accidentally stumble upon the house I was showing. So Byron and I made sure we rotated houses, trying not to go to the same one more than once. This way, the neighbors of these houses won't become suspicious either. We thought we had everything covered. And over the course of ten months, we really had everything covered. I didn't count the number of our meetings, but on average we met every two weeks with a couple of extra meetings thrown in at random when one of us just needed some extra time together. Each meeting was as comforting as the previous one. Knowing that someone wanted my body and wanted to share theirs with me was so exciting. It wasn't all that great at the time. To be honest, Byron wasn't any better than Rich at sex. But at the time, I needed to feel wanted. And Byron wanted me enough to work as hard as I did to make our romance happen. This has become the new normal. Rich didn't suffer because he almost never touched me sexually, let alone acknowledged me as a sexual being with desires to be wanted and needed. Byron provided these things for me. I saw no reason to stop. Now I sat in front of our computer monitor, sobbing over the loss of the man who, for ten months, had provided me with the intimacy and attention I craved. I had only been with him this morning, and it felt like I was still tingling from the sex we shared. I would miss the sex, but I also knew I would miss so much more. I knew because we exchanged emails every day, telling each other how much we missed each other and how much we couldn't wait to see each other again, even if it was only for half an hour. But our letters went deeper than that. We both didn't want to leave our spouses, 
I even thought I loved Rich more when I was having an affair with Byron because I didn't feel the same desperation and loneliness that I felt when there was no intimacy coming from me at all. It was as if Byron was taking the pressure off Rich. Even though Rich had no idea what was going on, Byron and I shared details about our families, our jobs, even the good times when our spouses provided us with something we weren't getting now. We celebrated accomplishments and provided each other with comfort and support when things weren't going so well. He seemed to be interested in every little thing in my life, and I felt the same about his. We even joked that we thought our spouses would be suitable for each other, since neither of them seemed too interested in providing intimacy and affection. We made plans for a pretend exchange, laughing at the fact that although it would never happen, it seemed logical. All that was lost, and although I would miss the sex, it was a relationship that would be hard to forget. I knew I couldn't. I knew that what Byron and I had would stay with me for the rest of my life. And yet, this knowledge did nothing to ease the pain and grief I felt. I thought about Rich. There was no way he could see my grief, because I wouldn't be able to explain to him why I was suffering so much. And yet, I didn't know how I was going to hide it from him. I couldn't even go out into the living room right now even if I wanted to, because I wouldn't be able to explain to him why I was crying. I couldn't tell him why my heart was torn apart. My first concern was that Rich would be going to bed soon, and if I couldn't stop my tears, I had no idea how I was going to hide it from him. The crying didn't stop, at least not in the near future. So my option was to stay in the office until I thought he might be asleep, and then crawl into bed next to him hoping not to disturb him. In the morning, he would get up and leave before me, and since he usually did not come up to me to kiss me before leaving, I knew that I could avoid him until the evening when he returned from work. That's exactly what I did. I put another news site on my computer, and if Rich happened to ask me on the way up the stairs, I would tell him that I was just catching up on interesting articles on the Internet. Of course, he didn't say anything, and when I heard him walk up the stairs, I relaxed. This brought on another wave of tears and sobs because without the fear of being caught, I was able to allow myself to truly express my emotions for the first time. I went back to the article I had read confirming his death. I just sat there and looked at his name on the screen, remembering the memories we made together. I thought back to the first time we had sex and the process we created to keep our affair a secret from our spouses and everyone else. Each memory that surfaced led to a new round of tears. At that moment, I did not see how I was going to live further, trying to hide my sadness from the whole world. I was sinking into a dark abyss and couldn't turn to anyone for help to get out. At that moment, another thought struck me. I reread the article on the screen. The last sentence suddenly stood out like a dark cloud, enveloping me and suffocating the life from me. It is believed that excessive speed may have contributed to the accident. The police must have thought he was driving too fast. Oh my God. We actually extended our meeting today, as we are in a furnished house with a bed available, as opposed to the usually empty premises. When we finished having sex, he looked at his phone and complained that it was too late and he needed to hurry. The last thing I saw of him was a quick kiss on the lips in the bedroom before he hurried to the front door. Was the extension of our meeting today the reason for his haste? Did I cause his accident by holding him longer than usual? I tried to remind myself that he also had a part in the decision to stay that day, and that it was funny to blame myself. But in my weak state, my mind did not listen to reason. All he could see was the damage that extra sex today could cause. This could have resulted in the death of my lover trying to rush back to his office or to his loving family right after we had made passionate love. The tears continued to flow. I turned off the computer making sure to clear my browser history so Rich couldn't see what sites I'd visited. By this time, it had been an hour since Rich had gone to bed, so I was pretty sure he was already asleep. I walked to our bedroom door and stood outside. His steady breathing told me he was sleeping, so I entered as quietly as possible and headed to the bathroom adjacent to our bedroom. I closed the door and turned on the light. I was shocked to see my face swollen and red in the mirror. Apparently, I cried more than I thought. I took a towel from the drawer and soaked it in cold water, 
then applied it to my face. The cold shock seemed to stop the tears for a moment. I took off my clothes and looked at myself in the mirror again. The sight of my naked body brought back memories of our day together today and the pleasure that Byron gave me. The realization that I would never get this from him again brought back the tears, and before I put on my nightgown, I again put the cold towel to my face. I climbed into bed next to Rich, but sleep did not come. Tears wet my pillow as I continued to process the memories of those exciting moments with Byron. I remembered earlier that day when he spanked my ass while he took me from behind, and how I wished I could experience more of that since Rich wasn't that adventurous, although I couldn't risk leaving marks on my body that might indicate at the fact that I was doing something forbidden, not that Rich spent any time looking at my naked body. With these thoughts bombarding my brain, I curled up into the tightest fetal position I could muster. I even turned my pillow over after a while to have a dry place for my head because the tears didn't stop. When I ran out of all the memories my brain could hold, I was left with one single question. How am I going to survive this? I must have dozed off because when my husband's alarm went off in the morning, I didn't expect it. If he followed his normal routine, he would get up and go show her without waking me, so I knew I should be able to avoid him at least until he returned from work later in the day. He got out of the shower and went straight to the clothes he had prepared the night before, so as not to turn on the closet light and risk disturbing me. As I got dressed, I realized a couple of things, that I wasn't usually awake when he was getting ready for work, and that he was careful not to disturb me while he showered and got dressed. I had not paid attention to these little things before, and now I was surprised to learn about the efforts he made to allow me to sleep longer. I also knew that he was a creature of habit and did the same thing every day, but it was nice to know that at some point he thought about my needs rather than his own. I heard Rich's footsteps on the stairs. I knew he would stop to drink the coffee he had made earlier in the evening in the coffee maker. I also knew there would be something quick for breakfast, sometimes fruit, but usually just a granola bar. Soon I heard him open and then close the front door, and I knew I had the whole day to myself. I got up and went to the bathroom again. I turned on the light and looked in the mirror, seeing that my face was still in a terrible state still swollen from a night full of tears. I couldn't go to work today, but I knew I had a couple of house showings scheduled. The tears started again when I realized that one of the shows was in the house where Byron and I had sex yesterday, which turned out to be the last time. I didn't think I could enter that house again. I picked up my phone and texted the other agent in the office, the one who was my best friend, and asked if she could take over my showings for the day. I didn't think she'd wake up this early but I hoped she'd see it and respond quickly enough that I wouldn't have to worry about it for the rest of the day. Just in case she couldn't, especially a furnished house. I messaged another agent as a backup in case the first one couldn't help me. With this done, I was lost. I didn't know what to do. I tried to lie down again, but sleep still eluded me. I needed to keep myself busy so that maybe my thoughts wouldn't get caught up in the scam and what happened yesterday. I ran a hot bath and added soothing oils, hoping that the hot water and atmosphere would help take my mind off Byron. It helped, but I still had random flashes of memories of those secret moments with him. I wondered if there would ever be a time when I wouldn't think about what I was doing. I came out of the bath and found some things that had been neglected around the house. I worked until the tears took over me again, and then I sat down and tried to calm down. I repeated this cycle three or four times and was glad that I was at least somewhat productive. I looked in the mirror again and decided that I needed to take a shower before Rich came home. After that, I started cooking dinner, something I didn't always have time to do since I often had house showings in the late afternoon and evening. I was preparing for his arrival. I knew I had to keep my emotions under control in front of him, and I couldn't hide from him for the next few days or weeks or however long it took to get over it. Rich arrived home at exactly 5.30 p.m., like clockwork. He looked at me a little confused when he smelled dinner already cooking. I could see him trying to take it all in, but I wasn't going to say anything until he asked. Finally, I think it got the better of him. Are you just home early? It's a pleasant surprise to smell dinner already being prepared. 
I tried to act as casually as possible without revealing my emotional state, so I calmly replied, I didn't go to the office today. I started having some allergic problems in the morning, which made me dizzy all day, so I asked someone to cover my shows and stayed here. I thought that dinner, already ready for your arrival, will be a pleasant surprise for you. He came over and kissed me on the cheek, a very rare occurrence in recent years, and something that definitely made me take notice. We usually fell into a very boring routine in the evenings, no talking during dinner, then straight into the living room and watch TV. Sometimes we discussed what we would watch, but usually that was it. The noise of the television kept the deafening silence from becoming too suffocating. Usually I hated this silence, but tonight I hoped for it. It would be much easier to hide my sadness if we didn't share unnecessary conversations. Thankfully, after an unexpected kiss on the cheek, we returned to our normal routines. I tried to focus on the TV shows he had chosen, but my thoughts couldn't help but wander to Byron and our time together. I began a strange inventory of our meetings, trying to remember each of them, knowing that our dates were so numerous that it would be impossible to remember individual cases. I managed to keep a straight face for the most part, but I had to get up once to go to the bathroom when I couldn't hold back my tears. Almost 24 hours have passed since I heard the devastating news. I didn't expect to get over my sadness so quickly, but I hoped to deal with it better. I couldn't keep running and hiding from Rich. Even in our boring evening routine, Rich would probably sense that something was wrong, and I didn't know what I would say to him if he did. It became too hard to hide. At 9.30 p.m., I got up and told him that my allergies were really bothering me, and I was going to take my allergy medicine and go to bed. He nodded at me, perhaps saying, Okay, honey. Or maybe it was just a random muttering sound, but it didn't matter. I went upstairs and immediately went into the master bathroom, checking my appearance in the mirror. I was glad to see that there wasn't too much redness around my eyes. At least this part was getting better. I knew that if I went to bed right away, I would have about an hour to fall asleep before Rich came upstairs. I also knew that lying in bed with nothing to do, my thoughts would probably return to the good times with Byron, but there were no other options, so I went to bed. As I lay there, Thinking about him and our time together, my hand involuntarily fell between my legs, not to please myself, but simply as a reflexive reaction to the intimacy we shared with each other. Sometime before Rich came upstairs, I fell asleep. I never heard him come into bed, nor did I hear him get up and leave the next morning. Byron's death may have affected me, but at least my relationship with my husband continued as if nothing had happened, which I realized was best for me now. The next day, I was able to come to the office. I still felt terrible. But with no home showing scheduled for today, it seemed like I could hole up in my office, updating listings and calling potential clients to try to move them along on the decisions they still had to make. This meant that I could close my door and isolate myself from the rest of the staff, knowing that interacting with co-workers would not benefit me. I took a break around 10.30 a.m. and opened the local morning newspaper online. I don't know why, but I ended up in the obituaries section to see if there was service information posted for Byron. It was scheduled for Saturday morning, which was two days later. I was faced with a dilemma. I really wanted to go, more for my own peace of mind than for any other reason. And technically, I might still be in a period where a caring real estate agent could come to pay respects to the surviving family. But the more pressing thought was that I couldn't handle it without crying and sobbing, and it would be hard to explain to anyone out there why I acted the way I did when Byron was essentially just a client who had bought a house through me. I was also afraid that the guilt I would feel hugging Gloria as we said goodbye would make my tears worse. After all, she was an innocent victim of my affair with her husband, just like my husband. I knew I needed to do something, because I thought it might help me find peace. I thought about Gloria and how much pain she must have been in. And yet, since her relationship with her husband was an open secret, she probably had all kinds of friends, family, and clergy to help her grieve. Since my relationship with her husband was not public, I really felt like I had to deal with this alone 
and I didn't know if I was strong enough to do it. So, at least by visiting the cemetery during his funeral, I could perhaps do a little therapy of my own. Therapy? The first time the idea of a professional psychotherapist who could help me came into my head. I weighed the pros and cons. If I could find a therapist who specialized in grief, someone who I assumed could work confidentially, I could work on grief and that person would see that. Because of my situation, I desperately needed his or her services. I didn't think Rich would find out about this since I had no problem hiding the affair from him for ten months. But then another thought struck me. Byron and I did a great job of keeping our affair a secret from everyone else. Or so we thought. Confiding in a therapist, although this was certainly subject to confidentiality laws, it would mean that I was telling someone else that I was cheating, and I didn't know if I was ready to admit it. I knew I was like this, but no one else knew it especially now that Byron had been killed. Was I willing to admit to someone else what I had done? I left this idea in the background. I decided that after Saturday, I would have a new perspective on this mess. Maybe then my head will clear and my grief will subside by then, if not because of the finality of Byron's funeral. I was pretty sure I wouldn't get any worse, even though I was doing it alone. I was the only judge of it and I wasn't sure I could judge it objectively. The rest of Thursday and Friday went pretty smoothly. I suffered from a couple of bouts of crying during the day, although I continued to feel more sad in the evenings when I was alone with Rich. At the time, I wasn't sure why, although the thought that it might be guilt never crossed my mind. But I knew that the usual silence of recent years was almost killing me now, because in this silence my thoughts always returned to Byron. On Saturday morning I got up early, right after Rich, who doesn't allow himself mornings for long sleep. I told him last night that I had a couple of house showings scheduled, which wasn't unusual for the weekend. I dressed professionally, and although I knew I wouldn't get out of the car into the cemetery, I still felt it necessary to dress appropriately for the occasion, perhaps as a final sign of respect for my relationship with Byron. I left the house to make the 25-minute drive to the cemetery. Being in the center of a large city, the cemetery seemed remote and quiet, surrounded by hundred-year-old trees and having a couple of ponds with fountains in the middle. It was a refuge from the world at high speeds. I found the tent where the burial ceremony would take place and parked as far away as I could while still being able to see what was happening. And then I waited. I didn't really know when they would arrive, but the thought of driving and parking next to the funeral home and then following the procession seemed too risky. It had been almost a year since I'd seen Byron's wife, Gloria, but I was driving the same car I'd driven when I showed them houses, and I just couldn't risk her seeing me there, wondering why my eyes were red and puffy. Finally, the procession arrived. I watched from the car as the hearse drove up to the tent above the grave. The first few cars after the hearse appeared to be limousines owned by the funeral home to transport either the family or pallbearers. I immediately recognized Gloria and her children as they stepped out of the second limousine and slowly walked towards the tent. Watching her escort her children to his final resting place brought out an emotion in me that I had never felt before. Suddenly, I felt guilty as hell for what I had been doing for the past ten months. Seeing them made it all too real for me. With family and guests under the tent, the back door of the hearse was opened, and the coffin was carried out and carried to the graveside. Watching the porters walk slowly, my chest tightened and tears began to flow again. But while I cried for myself and the fact that Byron and I would never get back together, I also cried for Gloria. I cried for the wife of the man I was having an affair with. I wanted to stay but there was no reason for it. I was not going to go where the service was. I didn't want to talk to anyone. It was as if I just needed to see his coffin being taken out of the hearse, and that was enough for me to accept the finality of the situation and hopefully move on. I started the car and drove away quietly. I wasn't ready to return home, but I had no goal, no destination. I just drove around, wandering around the secondary streets of the city for more than an hour. I finally stopped and bought a soda and a bag of chips, 
more to keep myself occupied than because I was actually hungry or thirsty. I collected my thoughts and headed back home. I wasn't sure what I would do, but I knew I couldn't spend the day riding around without a goal. Gradually, I tried to restore order in my life. I was relieved to find that the tears had subsided within the first couple of days after Byron's funeral. Although I still thought about him every day and missed what we had together, I was able to get through the day relatively without tears. I didn't know if this was an official sign that I was healing, but since I still hadn't shared this part of my life with anyone, I felt like the lack of tears was a good sign. I thought about the visit to the cemetery and the guilt I felt, as well as my sympathy for Gloria and her children. I didn't know if she knew about Byron and me, but I thought it unlikely since we'd been going on for so long, and I assumed Byron would have told me if she knew. If that were the case, then Byron's secret would go with him to the grave, and I would be left alone with the knowledge of what we did. Knowing the grief I could cause Gloria, I knew I would never tell her. Of course, I wasn't going to tell Rich either, but part of my pain came from knowing how much she was suffering and knowing that I was mourning her as much as I was mourning myself, only added to the confusion I found in the cemetery. The tears for Byron lessened. Could I put aside the pain I felt for Gloria and the guilt I felt myself? As the days turned into weeks and months, I found myself taking a little break at home, Rich went on a three-day business trip out of state midweek after the funeral. Although I no longer had to hide the scam, I still tried not to show myself crying in front of him, maintaining our already weak relationship. His absence has given me the opportunity to focus again on my work, putting all my effort into my listings and working with potential home buyers and sellers. He left on Tuesday morning and was due back on Thursday evening, which was a fairly typical trip for him. For some reason, I was awake when he was getting ready to leave, which was unusual. I went downstairs to see that his coffee maker had already prepared his coffee. I knew the procedure. Drink one cup at home before leaving and take the rest in the thermos he washed the night before. As he walked down the stairs, I met him with his coffee in his hands. Rich turned around and suddenly stopped when he saw me. A slight smile did not leave his face. A smile that I had not seen for many years. This is a pleasant surprise, he exclaimed as he took the cup from my hands. He looked at the counter and saw a thermos sitting there for him. Thermos too? Why do I need this treatment? I didn't really have an answer. I just woke up and stood up. But after seeing his smile and our little conversation, I was glad I did it. Nothing much, I guess, except that you'll be gone for three days and I'll miss you. So I thought I'd get up and see you off. I was surprised at how convincing it sounded when I said it, and I felt some regret for not having thought of it sooner. I made a mental note to remember what I did today and try it again on Friday. It could have been a change from an already established routine and become meaningless, but I realized that some of the responsibility for this lack of meaning in other things lies with me, and perhaps I could learn from it and try to make it special. Rich packed his briefcase and took his coat from the closet, as he was putting it on, he looked at me and asked, What are you going to do while I'm gone? Another surprise. When did he become interested in what I was doing in his absence? I already had a prepared answer to this question. I'll probably spend most of my time in the office calling potential clients and trying to set up showings. Things haven't been going well lately, so I need to step up my game. He headed towards the door, and I followed him. I put my hand on his arm, and he surprised me by turning around and giving me a small kiss on the lips. Watching him walk down the sidewalk to his car, I felt a little confused. He was paying more attention to me than he had in a long time. Why was today different? He had gone on business trips before, a very common practice in his duties as a bank inspector. I would guess that at least once a month, he would go away for two or three days out of the week. The only difference I could think of was that I was down before he was, and that almost never happened. This made me think, how much of this stagnation of our relationship was my fault? It was true that he was stuck in a rut, but perhaps my own routine was thinking too much about how we were, nothing like who we were at the beginning of our marriage. I felt it was stupid to blame him for all our problems, and yet I was afraid that that was exactly what I was doing. It definitely gave me something to think about as I prepared for work. 
It had been three days since Byron's funeral, and although I still thought about him every day in one way or another, I found that the grief I still felt didn't stop me from doing what I needed to do. My last bout of tears was on Sunday morning, the day after I watched Gloria and her children and her entire family send Byron off. I looked forward to work, hoping that the energy I felt would help me catch up. My work suffered terribly while I was lost in my grief. It was too easy to come and close the door to hide from the rest of the world when I felt tears coming. I haven't shown a house since the last time I was with Byron. In fact, I haven't even contacted a potential client in about a week. Keeping in touch with my clients has been the most important part of my successful sales record. I cared about them and wanted them to find their dream homes. So keeping in touch with them while they were looking was important. I opened my client list on the computer and started calling. It was difficult to contact some clients during the day because they were often at work and could not take my calls. But I always left detailed voicemails, including information about potential new properties. Those with whom I was able to talk were glad to hear me. A couple of them have decided not to look for new properties just yet, but have given me permission to contact them if I think the perfect home has become available. They knew I wouldn't call them to show them just any house. They trusted me to find them something perfect. An hour into my morning, it was time to call Justin and Amber Stoddard, a young professional couple who had been married for three years and decided to wait with the kids until they bought their forever home, as they called it. Because of this, they were extremely picky, which sometimes caused frustration for agents who would spend countless hours working with a couple that seemed impossible to satisfy. But the Stoddards were a sweet couple, not much different from Rich and I years ago, so I wanted them to find a home where they could stay forever. Amber Stoddard answered after the second ring. Hello? Good morning, Amber. This is Julie Harris from the Sunshine Agency. It's been a few days since I last spoke with you, so... I wanted to see how you're doing with your home search. There was a pause from the other end, and then Amber spoke again. I can't believe you called. Justin and I were just talking about you last night. We've decided to increase our cap by $50,000 if we want to find a home that will meet all our needs. I was very happy to hear this. Of course, it meant an increase in my commission if I was able to sell them a house but I was happy because it was almost impossible to find what they wanted within their budget. This gave them a chance to look at at least seven additional homes that were listed by my agency alone, not to mention the homes listed by other agents who were in the multi-listing program. I said, okay, Amber, I'll start looking for houses with that higher limit in mind. I know for a fact that we have at least two or three that I think will meet all your requirements. How soon do you want to start look? Amber responded, Actually, Julie, we have one that we'd like to watch as soon as possible. If possible, after three o'clock today would be great. We're looking forward to watching this one because we know it has a lot of what we're looking for, but until now, it's been out of our price range. It's time to see how good it really is. I was surprised they wanted to watch one so quickly they must have been researching offers online after they raised their cap, and whatever the house was, they were excited to see it. Amber, that's great. I have the whole evening free, so I think we can do a showing if the house isn't occupied. Which house would you like to see? Amber said, 68 Osborne Road in Norwich. I immediately fell into a panic. I knew this address too well. It was the last house I was in before Byron's accident. In fact, it was the house where we last had sex, the house he rushed out of because we stayed longer than usual. This was the house from which he was hurrying when he met with the accident that took his life. My eyes filled with tears again and I knew I had been silent for too long and I had to say something to Amber. Somehow my autopilot kicked in and I heard my voice confirm to her that I would meet them there at 3.15 that evening. When I disconnected the call, I wasn't sure if I could do it. I knew that sooner or later I would have to enter that house again if I wanted to sell it. I also knew that this house was a good option for the Stoddards and the only reason I hadn't shown it to them yet was because it was out of their original price range. Apparently, my grief over Byron's death had not gone as far as I had hoped. I quickly scheduled the showing on the multi-listing schedule to let other agents know the house was not available for showings at that time. 
Then I got up and went to the bathroom to wipe my face with cold water and try to come to my senses. I needed to figure out how I could show off this house without letting the pain of Byron's death get the better of me. The only way I could imagine dealing with this was to arrive early and face whatever emotions I found upon entering the house. I decided that I would work until about 1 p.m. and then take a late lunch, which would get me home a little after 2 p.m. and give me a little over an hour to deal with the memories of my late lover. I finished calling clients and then made a list of calls to sellers to see if they wanted to change the price. Those calls could wait until tomorrow, but the list was ready so I could start as soon as I got to the office. Finally, the clock showed 13 swao, and I took the keys to the house on Osborne Road and left the office. I stopped at a small cafe that I liked, located approximately halfway between the office and home. While I ate, I tried to anticipate my reactions when I entered that house. I tried to encourage myself that I had handled it all well enough so far, and this was just another obstacle that I needed to overcome in order to get my life back to something resembling normality. When I pulled up to the house, no amount of talking to myself could have prepared me for the excitement that filled my heart. As I approached the front door along the sidewalk, my heart began to race, and I felt my legs become weak. I took a deep breath as I inserted the key into the lock and opened the door. My mind immediately went back to that fateful day. I replayed events as if my memory were a digital recorder. I waited for Byron as he walked up the steps, and as soon as he walked in, he gave me a passionate kiss. It was a routine that we had practiced many times. Usually he would start by petting him, but... For some reason that day I was so happy to see him that I quickly got down on my knees and unzipped his fly and got to work. After our first meeting, we often pleasured each other, and I learned that this was a great way to destroy evidence. That is, not have to worry about cleaning anything. Byron obviously enjoyed my skills, something he never stopped showing me. Our sex wasn't anything special, but it never felt routine. Perhaps the betrayal factor kept us on edge. It also didn't hurt that we had sex in many different houses for sale. So changing the location also helped keep that excitement and freshness. We were always careful not to leave marks on our bodies that might raise questions among our spouses. But I knew Byron well enough to understand that he had his own perverted side, and when he had me from behind, he couldn't resist and began to spank me, inciting me even more. The strokes of his open palm quickly turned into pleasure, and I encouraged him to spank me harder. The thought of this man taking over and having me when we really didn't have time took over me, and as he continued to pound my ass, I encouraged him to have me even more. My arms and legs could no longer hold me up, so I rolled onto my back and relaxed. Byron looked at his watch and exclaimed, Oh damn, I need to hurry. As he pulled his feet into his pants and hurriedly put on his shoes, I just stood there and looked at him with a big smile on my face. It was an amazing meeting. The last time I saw him, he blew me a kiss as he disappeared through the bedroom door. I listened to the front door slam, then his car, and finally the sound of his car driving away. And, as it turned out, out of my life forever. Now... Remembering this meeting, I felt a sudden insight. For the first time, I realized that my grief was not related to the loss of sex with Byron. He had the same equipment as Rich, and used it the same way. Of course, the frequency of sex with Rich decreased over time, but we still made love. In fact, there was a period during this relationship when I had both men on the same day, which I realized probably wasn't the smartest thing to do. But then again, Having a con probably wasn't smart either. What I realized was that I missed the intimacy, the hugs and kisses, the long conversations we had through the thousands of emails we sent each other through our secret accounts over those ten months. Byron and I never said we loved each other. We both knew it started out as illicit sex between two people who met by chance when one bought a house from the other. But with this sex a connection began to form that I did not suspect, and as I think now, which could be called love. I realized that this connection had only strengthened over the past ten months. Not that Rich and I ever fought, but with Byron, there was no worry about the house, about my sons, and their problems that arose when they were away from home. 
We never had to discuss our financial situation, wonder if we'd have enough to retire, or even think about when that would be. With Byron, we didn't have to worry about all those things that sometimes make life difficult, so our bond could grow much easier. I hung my head, realizing that by getting involved with Byron, I wasn't trying to improve the connection that Rich and I once had, and still had, albeit in a very different state than before. I never planned on leaving Rich while Byron and I were together, and I knew he didn't plan on leaving his wife Gloria either. I doubt either of us really expected the connection that developed, but since I couldn't ask him now, I could only guess at his feelings on the matter. I checked my phone and saw that the Stoddards would be here in about ten minutes. I headed to the bathroom to check my face and noticed that it wasn't as red and blotchy as it used to be when I cried. Maybe I didn't cry thinking about Byron and us for the last time. Maybe I needed this exercise to put our relationship in perspective. The realization that it was the connection I valued so much and not sex still weighed heavily on my thoughts. Then I remembered this morning when Rich and I were in the kitchen together and the little playful things that surprised me. Can I get this connection with Rich back? Will he work with me and listen when I tell him how much I miss it and how much I need it? He probably missed it too, but like me, he didn't think it was worth the effort as we slipped into a comfortable but extremely lonely existence. The big question is, should I ever confess my affair to Rich? If we could reconnect our spark, even just partially, which would be better than nothing, would any progress be possible if he found out what I did and decided to divorce his cheating wife? He would never understand what I got out of it. In fact, if we improved our relationship, it would be as a direct result of my ten months with Byron. I knew it would never justify the scam, but it made me see how much I missed that intimacy, and I hoped that Rich and I could get that back. On the other hand, I hid those ten months from Rich quite easily, which I'm not particularly proud of, but it was the truth. Now that the scam was gone, I assumed that my guilt must begin to torment me, and I wondered if this would be my punishment for myself, and if so, how long would it last? I thought this would never stop. I returned to the main living area just in time to see the Stoddards approach the front door. I took a deep breath and then let it out. I knew I had a lot of questions to answer, but I was glad that when I opened the door and greeted Justin and Amber, it was with a sincere smile. I was waiting at the front door in a new set of underwear when Rich returned from his business trip. His puzzled look didn't give me much hope at first, but honestly, it had been a lot of time since I'd greeted him like that. I kissed him and told him how much I missed him and wanted to show him right now. Even though I knew he was probably tired from the trip, he allowed me to lead him into the bedroom where we began to heal the problems that were plaguing our lives. After that, we talked about our relationship. We both accepted that they weren't very healthy and had become a situation where two lonely people couldn't share their feelings with each other. We continued talking as we went out for lunch. I enjoyed hearing Rich tell me how much he appreciated having me down with him on Tuesday morning when he left on this trip. He was afraid to tell me because he didn't think I wanted to get up so early just to see him off. There were many little things that we were afraid to tell each other about. We decided that we needed to improve communication if we were to get out of our trouble. I can say things are getting better, and while I hope we continue to get closer again, knowing that we have made progress is wonderful. Now we go out a couple times a week, sometimes just to eat and enjoy each other's company, sometimes to do other activities like dancing, which turns out Rich always wanted to do but never talked about it. I even started going to the gym with him three times a week before work. Little things like this really help us feel closer to each other. I still haven't told him about the scam, and I'm pretty sure I'll take this secret with me to the grave. As I expected, my guilt grows every day, especially as my relationship with Rich strengthens. The scam made me see what was truly missing in my marriage and motivated me to take steps to regain lost intimacy. But having a con was not the right way to do it. So I will punish myself for my selfish affair and continue to take steps to ensure it never happens again. One more thing. The Stoddards bought a house and they are thrilled to finally have a home where they can start expanding their family. I hope when they reach their empty nesting years, 
The fire of romance between them will continue to burn so that they don't make the same mistake I did. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one.